first, right? Yeah. You got to save that sandwich? Yeah. Okay. okay. Let's, yeah, let's throw the bag and stuff and everything else in the garbage. Perfect. Thank you. You want a punch or not? Uh, no, I'm okay on that. Okay. On August 16th, 2018, Brian Racine was shot in the head as he slept. According to family members, Racine, who suffered from mental illness, had gone off his medication and had decided to move to Ogden a month prior to the shooting. Neither his mother, brother, or two daughters were aware that he was living in a homeless camp. His killers, Corey Fitzwater and Dalton Nakin, looked down on the homeless community. Both men believed homeless people to be a problem since they do not contribute to society. After several rounds of questioning and multiple changes to his story, including claiming to have been in the area only to smoke marijuana, Aiken eventually confessed that they went to the camp specifically to find and harass homeless people. Racine, as far as investigators can tell, was chosen at random. No connection between the men could ever be made, and it may never be clear why things escalated to the point of murder. So, I've got a few things I would like to quickly talk to you about. You are obviously in custody. So, uh -huh. go ahead and do the random before I can do that for you, okay? So, you have the right to remain silent. And he said, he's against you in a court of law. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. If you can't afford to hire a lawyer, I want to be able to present you before any questioning if you wish. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Yes. Having these rights in mind, do you wish to talk to us now? Uh, talk to you? Yeah, me and the detective. Yeah, I got it on the phone. Uh, we're looking to get your side of the story, what's going on here, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, you know, that's it, yeah. yeah. We you. Aiken polishes off his lunch, unconcerned as he has read his rights. He shows no visible sign of being upset. In fact, he almost sounds cheerful as he interacts with the detective. I can't do that to you, we get through that part, so. Um, let's just start off. What will you tell me about what was going on this morning? Let's see. I got pulled over and I had marijuana. Okay. What about before the traffic stop? What were you, what was going? What were we doing? Oh, we were walking in the park. By the park, you mean like the pond and the trail and all that? Yeah. What do they call it? Uh, the old Indian place where the rivers meet. I'm familiar with that? Is that a fancy term. Do you know what? Yeah, it's right there where the Ogden and the Weaver River oh. Weaver River meet. But you're so you're on that, that, that whole trail complex that's back there behind the one you went in I think I know where you went in to where you go across the bridge and the road goes the trail goes up and down both ways, right? Okay. Yeah, so let's see. So if you cross that main bridge of the parking lot mm -hmm. and then you just kinda of keep going straight ish and then it curves to the right. Yeah, right there where the two rivers come together. Yeah. Okay. And you were with, who were you walking with? Corey Fitzwater. Is he family friend? Yep, family friend, exactly. Oh, oh, what time do you think you guys got out there? Oh, it was late. We just got done busting up concrete for his neighbor um, with the sledgehammer. So we were kind of having a good time, you know, but I, I think it was, I think it was two to three. Okay. We're talking about AM, right? Uh-huh. You guys work on that late bus and concrete too? Well, we only bust the concrete till about 12. But they had it jacked up and they were trying to bust it and it just would bust off a little piece every time. Mm -hmm. So we just started going to town and it just all went. It's good therapy, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, where's the neighbor, where does that live at? The what? Where was that at? You guys the concrete? Uh, so it'd be Kitty Corner in his backyard. The word just, so neighbor of its neighbor of Corey's? Yes. Where does Corey live at? Uh, by Hoagie's. Oh. Okay, so you guys are busting concrete. Um, okay, so 
what I'm talking to you about, I'm not worried about the marijuana or none of that. Okay? So, that's all I'm going to interview for. So you guys break concrete. You guys normally go to the river to, so I'm assuming happens to go there for you to drink beer or smoke a blunt. And exactly. Walk quite beautiful out there, right? Yeah. Okay. Is that something you guys normally do? Like, no. Like a thing for you? Yeah. We usually just hang out. How far did you guys walk around the trail? I think I had the freeway in sights, at least. Like, when you start, when you take that turn off in the distance, you can see the freeway. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see anybody else on the trails, or? Yeah, a couple of times. Are there late night revelers, or transients, or what? Uh, campfires. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I would assume transients, huh? Right. Forgive me, I think he's on the knows area better than I do. So you guys park in the direction, so when you first say you're walking, are you going east? Unlike many suspects, Aiken doesn't seem to mind answering questions. He neither exercises his right to remain silent, nor does he act cocky or passive-aggressive. Still, it's also possible that he thinks that if he appears cooperative, he won't be considered a suspect. He doesn't even try to deny his marijuana possession, which heightens his impression of having nothing to hide. North, how does that trail split off? You can... Yeah, so it'd go... Um... See, that would be south, and then it heads to the west. Okay. So, and how long? So you guys get there? You think around two to three? Um, yeah. How long do you guys out there for? Uh, enough to smoke a little, basically. Sure. An hour, half hour. I know it's hard to tell time, but half the hour. Do you guys hear any commotion or anything out there? Well. I kind of have a feeling that I know what you guys are after. Like, did someone get killed? I mean, so I heard a gunshot. For sure. That's just that vibrates let us know it's still working. Where were you having heard the gunshot? I mean, relatively speaking. So, when you start heading towards the west, there's like a weird vinyl fence like if you they got voltage up across it you're not supposed to cross it right about right there um i think it's a junkyard if you cross the fence right there aiken admits to hearing a gunshot and does his best to describe in detail where he was at the time if he is being honest this would possibly help eliminate him as a suspect if he is guilty giving such a detailed description could work against him all it takes is one witness or piece of forensic evidence to throw his entire story in doubt. What did you see, hear, smell after the good shot? Uh, nothing. Yeah, just, that's it. What did you guys do? Um, well, we're kind of country. I guess we didn't even pay no mind to it, to tell you the truth. I thought it was weird to late, but yeah. Did you guys just continue on your way? Did you start? Okay. No, sorry, I missed it. So did you guys continue just walking the direction you're going? Did you guys? Yeah, we we turned around about when you hit that fence with the voltage, and you can see the freeway. Okay. Just walk back. When you say by that fence, does that mean you were by the fence or that's where you heard the shot? I was by the fence. You were by the shot. If, where did you hear the shot? If I had to pinpoint the shot, what it came from, oh, what's that business? Um, the mechanical place, HVAC place, uh, Mountain Valley Mechanical, mm -hmm. I bet you that's I think where. What direction is that from where you're at? <clears throat> Let's see. It's right on that hard turn where it says 15 miles an hour. That's where um, I think it probably was. Okay. Because um, that's where that Rocky Mountain Mechanical is. Mm -hmm. So you say you were by the vinyl fence and you heard it by the hard turn. 
So you think it was to the north of you then? Let's see. So, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then, so how much longer were, so you got a shot, you guys finished whatever you're doing to get back to the car, how long do you think that took? And then you guys immediately got in the car, started and left, or did you guys hang around in the parking lot for a little bit? No. We just left, got pulled over real quick. <laughs> Didn't take long. Did you guys go on to any of the camps while you were down there? Mm-mm. Like the homeless people? Mm -hmm. Uh-uh. No, we actually never came face to face with any of them. Just there's a time. Just through the fires. Mm -hmm. Do you know any homeless people that live out there? I do not. When asked, Aiken denies knowing any homeless people or having come face to face with them. Again, this is a risky move. If he is lying, he can't be sure that the police don't have a witness that can contradict his claim. He might feel confident that his friend will say the same. But if their stories don't add up, things will look bad for him. All right. So next question I have for you is the fire that they found you with at six hours, is that right? The what? The guy you had in your car? Uh-huh. Where did you get that? I'm sorry, I missed it again. The what? The gun you had in your car? Oh, yeah. Where, where did you get that? So that's Corey's. Okay. Do you know how long Corey's had it for? No clue. Did you guys take that with you when you were doing your walk? No, I had some bullets in my pocket from earlier, but... Detective Haney questions him about the gun in the car. Aiken is quick to say that the gun belongs to his friend and that they had been shooting it early in the day. This is a better tactic than denial. Not only does he still come across as cooperative, but he knows that a gun can be tested to see if it's been fired recently. However, that won't help him if the bullet matches the one taken from the body of the victim. But he likely hasn't had the time to think that far ahead. So we were shooting it earlier, but we didn't take it. Where were you guys shooting at? Uh, West Warren. His uh, parents and the law a pretty good pad out there. Just lots nice. of country, just all oh, yeah. freaking nice. your targets. Yeah, it's awesome. Was Corey's gun? Was that Corey's ammo too? Did you, did you? Yeah. Yeah, I actually tried, uh, we were going to make a trade. Um, I took him my Universal, 30 caliber carbine Universal. So, we were just on a gun kick, kind of on a trading thing. Did you going to trade the carbine for the... I was thinking about it, but he never could talk me into it, because it's my, my uncles that made, uh, there's a PT Cruiser that's so fancy at Frank Mares in Lagoon. Right. But I've he, got kids that should go yeah. down there, but I don't. <laughs> but he built it, so it's kind of okay. close to me. Yeah, it's a little like that. Yeah. So you guys are in any camps down there? You don't know any? Was it, were you and Corey together the whole time? Did you guys ever break up to take a leak or for anything? I guess there were a few leak breaks, probably. Yeah. But now we were pretty much together. So, when you guys were separated for whatever, you know, going to take a urinate or whatever, did you Corey leave you? Did you leave Corey? Um, I think I left him once, he left me once. I mean, not leave. Right, bad sight. Yeah. Go do your business. Anything else that was going on up there that you think might have been weird or odd or struck your senses as kind of... Yeah, the whole night, man. Like, uh, just gave me a bad feeling. Sure as heck showed up as a bad one. Did I articulate that at all? Like, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, kind of like the Holy Ghost, I guess. <laughs> just some place you shouldn't be right then. 
And the bullets you had in your pocket, those were unfired rounds. Correct. Right. Like we do, you just throw 50 rounds in your pocket and go to the load layer out there. Yeah. What was Corey thinking about? Is he saying anything? How, how was Corey last night? Yeah, he, he was upset. He, uh, his wife was accusing him of cheating on her, which he claims for sure hasn't. Um, but it makes him think that she is. That's what he told me. So yeah, we were we were venting that night for sure. I was kind of there for him. How was Corey when he was upset? Is he uh, calm? Does he get a he, little angry? He, he gets a little angry, but I think it's his uh, war stuff. His... Moving away from the subject of the gun, Aiken is asked if they are ever separated for any reason, such as a bathroom break. Hesitating, as if unsure which answer would best benefit him, he agrees that that was probably the case at least a few times. He's given up the seemingly more secure alibi of never being alone for the chance to throw his friend under the bus. If it comes down to it, he can always try to claim that his friend committed the crime while they were separated. Um, Iraq, PTSD, I think he's retired. Tired and he's like 30 years old. He's got a purple heart. Can't be convinced for that. Yeah. It sounds like it didn't come cheap, obviously. Do you know Corey's wife pretty well? Yeah. Are you married, kids? This is for your life. How old are you? 20, turning 28. How much are you? Enjoy it while you can. Okay, so an area of concern or question that we have. Mm -hmm. So you guys were there. How do I want to word this? We find in life, especially the place where coincidence doesn't occur a lot. Usually if things happen and they seem tied together, they're most likely tied together somehow, right? Uh -huh. So would there be any reason why we would find a spent shell casing that matches the gun you guys had at the scene of what we're investigating? I'm going to come clean right now, okay? Yeah, thank you, because the forensic evidence tells us a story, and you're, you're not helping yourself. Okay. Um, so Corey did leave, and that's when I heard the gunshot. And that is it, man. The more Aiken speaks, the more it sounds like he's setting up his friend Corey to take the fall. He tells the detective that Corey was very upset, thinking his wife might be cheating on him and that he was trying to be supportive. He then adds that the other man has issues with PTSD. This all adds up to make his friend sound unstable and potentially violent, with Aiken putting himself in the role of supportive, stable friend. And that's when we left, because I knew something bad happened, but he didn't say nothing. How, would, how did he seem after? Calm, I guess. Like, like you know, you could have been friends for a while. Uh-huh. Okay. Did his, so post... When you're saying he left the gunshot and after, did you see him more relaxed? relaxed? Uh huh. Yeah. No, in this circumstance now, if what you're telling us is the truth, mm -hmm. you're telling us you come clean, you're telling us this is the truth. Yes. Um, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm you, telling you that. To, yeah, you need to get off any thoughts of protecting Corey. Okay. Okay. When we ask okay. him questions and we're and, and things like that, well, I don't want to drag these out of you. You need to give us all the details. This is not a short story. This is a long story, right? Okay. So if you give a short, a short detail, like oh, I walked away, I heard a gunshot, I thought something bad happened. There's a lot of shit that went up before you walked away from him. There's uh -huh. a lot of stuff that went on after. You are thinking about you now. Uh -huh. If you're telling us the truth, uh -huh. you're not protecting Corey anymore. Right. Because if you're not a witness, what are you? Uh, 
uh, let's see, what would it be? You know, what are they, a bystander? Something no. Like uh, yeah. No, we call that in police work a suspect. Oh, okay. Suspect and or accomplice. Do you want to be a suspect, an accomplice, or a witness? Well, I didn't do anything, so I don't want to be any of those. Uh, no, 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 what you want to be is a witness. Uh, oh, okay. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, you don't want to be an accomplice. You don't want to be a suspect. You want to be a witness. Yeah. Now, you could have the potential to be a very good witness. Mm -hmm. Or you could be resistive and not share with us all the details, which is going to make you an accomplice. Uh -huh. Does that all make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Sure. So when we ask you things, even if, if don't don't short don't short the answers, and also mm -hmm. if we don't ask details and you have details, share them because you don't want anything to do with the end result of a man dying, right? Yes, exactly. You understand, witness. It's a good role. Okay. Accomplice means you share punishment with the actor and themselves. Uh -huh. The courts don't differentiate. Yeah. If he shoots somebody and I'm there, and I, even if I know about it, and I don't do anything, I'm an accomplice and I share his prison sentence. After Haney presses him and says that he doesn't believe that it was a coincidence that they were there at the time of the shot, Aiken goes through with the narrative he has been carefully setting up. He admits that when Corey left him is when he heard the shots. The most likely scenario is that he is betting on Corey's history with PTSD to make him look as if he was capable of committing murder on his own. All he really needs during a trial is reasonable doubt. So far, he might be able to pull this off. So okay. you don't want to be that guy, right? Correct. And I knew nothing about this. So like, let's go back. Okay. You guys just didn't randomly be walking down a trail. He walks around and just decides to shoot somebody. There's something that led you guys to that camp. And that's why I brought up his uh, wife still. Because mm -hmm. I think really that's what it is. Because I can't think of any reason. Okay. Well, he, he wanted you to take him down there. Yeah, who picked the spot to go? Uh, I always knew it. Yep. Yeah. Because I grew up in Marius Slayerville. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying you guys, what, what led you guys there? Tonight. We know you know the spot. What led you there last night? <laughs> yeah, marijuana. So were you going to buy marijuana? No, we were smoking it. Okay. So, so the cops found my bag. So here, here's the story that I'm kind of I'm kind of getting from you, and, and, and if this is what you're going to go with, uh, yeah. it's not going to be good for you. Okay. You're going to say that you guys randomly showed up at a random spot to randomly smoke some marijuana, ran into a random camp, and shot some guy. Oh, yeah, that sounds bad. Yeah. No, I'm thinking what happened was uh, there was a reason you guys went there. The guy, the, the guy that, that, that was there, you knew, or Corey knew, well, or wait, okay. wait, Corey or you knew he was there. So you guys went down there to deal with that. Now, I understand you not wanting to be involved in the actual process of it, but there's something that led you guys to that spot. I refuse to believe you. I mean, that Corey just randomly picked some guy and shot him. Start with the truth, dude. I'm, I'm kind of being serious. I think that's what happened. I think he literally just shot the guy. I mean, I know that sounds bad, but literally. That's I, a hard sell in a, in a court of law. Yeah, it is. When you're on the stand and we're trying to convince the jury that, no, no, Dalton didn't have anything to do with this. Oh, okay. I got you. It's uh, his PTSD stuff. I don't think this is the first time it's happened, but I think it's something to do with that. Okay, so I, what did Corey say before he shot the guy? Uh, nothing. Like, it was... What made you separate from him? He went uh, off the trail, and I followed him. Okay. And he shot the guy. So you were there? Yeah. Okay, so that, that's him. one thing we want to make clear, that you guys didn't separate. You saw what happened. The detectives seem to go along with him. They tell him he can either be an accomplice or a witness, and that the best thing he can do to save himself is to answer their questions. However, this does not mean that they believe Aiken's story. But the more he talks and the more relaxed he becomes, the likelihood of being able to catch him in a lie increases. They can also try the same ploy with Corey Fitzwater. If they are able to play the two off of each other, they might be able to get a clearer picture of what actually happened. Yeah. So that, that's helpful because, because to say that he randomly walks away from you and does this, you, he walks off the trail towards a camp. Yeah, and I Does he him. say something about going to that camp? Is he pissed off at that camp? No, he sees it. Okay. But no. So you guys walk towards this camp and it's random. You say Corey doesn't know this guy. Yeah. You don't know this guy. Yeah. So you walk into this camp. Did they say anything to you? I think the guy was sleeping, to okay. tell you the truth. So um, the guy's in bed sleeping. Where's he at? 
Uh, on the ground. He's sleeping on the ground? Yeah. Is he in a tent under a tarp in a, uh, just laying on the dirt in a sleeping bag? Just, just the dirt, I think. Okay. I think. So yeah. tell me, so, when you follow according to the camp, kind of tell me about the camp a little bit. Okay. There was, it was kind of hard to see because it was dark, dark right? and yeah. his fire looked like it pretty much went out. Okay. Um, but there was a big tent by it. Okay. So there's a big tent there. Uh huh. Okay. And you walk in, and you think he's asleep. I don't walk in. He's asleep outside the tent. He's on the ground. That's what I'm saying. When you walk yeah. into the camp, you believe he's asleep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And what does Corey say? He kind of mumbles in like a drunk talk, like, how are you doing? Corey says that? Uh huh. Okay. Is he drunk? Yeah. He probably was like 10 deep. Probably. Ten beers? Uh-huh. Okay. Plus, have you guys smoked marijuana uh -huh. that one? Yeah. Okay, so we've got marijuana and beer in it. And you say mumble something. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. yep. And, and to the guy. To the guy. Yep. And then what? Shot him. What did you guys say? Anything to him? I don't know. It's almost like I, I just didn't want. You know what I mean? And so I don't think I looked when he shot him. Okay. But if I had to guess... Somewhere here. Okay, so he shoots him somewhere in the upper body. That one. Uh, then he takes off running, and I don't know what else to do but run to, I guess. Okay. Get in the truck, get pulled over. Okay. The forensic evidence on the scene doesn't tell that story. Okay. The things that we can prove don't tell me that, don't tell us that story. Okay. Now Aiken's beginning to alter his story since the detective isn't buying the fact that they were just randomly in the same spot with the victim. Before, Aiken claimed that he and Corey were separated when the shooting occurred. Now he says that he actually witnessed the murder. It's true that he could have been lying to save his friend at the start of the interview, but it's more likely that his story is evolving in an effort to change himself. Either way, it is proven that he's willing to be dishonest, a fact that now casts anything he says in doubt. There was, there was more to it. Okay. So you, I'll, I'll try, I'm going to quit try. dragging shit. No, and up and we're seriously. Gonna, you I'm, need to tell us everything. Okay. okay. I'm trying. I really am. Because there's more to it. But you need to understand that, that when we ask you questions, a lot of times we already know what those answers are. Yeah. Okay. And if you, and, and when, you when you leave things out of the story, makes it you, makes it look bad for you. Okay. So we need to stop that. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So where'd you want to know? Because I thought. I, I want to know the truth is what I want to know. But okay. I know what all the, I know what all the evidence is. I know what the forensic evidence tells us. We know a lot of this story already. Uh -huh. I want you to tell me that story. I want you to be honest with me and be a witness to this, not a suspect. No, I just left that scene with CSI. Okay, yeah. I know exactly what happened there. Yeah. Okay. So he said there's more to it than just running away. Because a lot of the things you're telling us. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So I took off running. He took off running. We, I lost him. Okay. And I got to the truck and I had to wait for him for. 25 minutes, I'll bet you. Um, that's probably the part that was miss, missing, huh? Well, I wouldn't say so. And he said he ran into more people and fought them with his fists. Okay. Some more stuff happened in the camp. Uh, that was away from the camp. That was somebody else's camp. camp. He's asking you. He's, he's making a statement to you. More stuff happened in the camp. After the shooting happened, that's what we're trying to get the truth about. You guys didn't oh. walk. In, you guys didn't walk in banging and run away. There was more to it than that. I promise you. Yeah, I, I really do promise you. Everything is starting to fall apart. Aiken's series of events don't line up with the forensic evidence. Every time the detective pushes Aiken to tell the truth, he will conveniently remember something but it's clear at this point that he's just making up whatever he thinks they want to hear. Without knowing exactly what evidence they have, it's hard for him to know which parts of the story he needs to include to be believed and which parts he can safely avoid mentioning that might incriminate him further. If he doesn't regret not having a lawyer present yet, he will soon. Alright, tell you what, I really do. Tell you what, we're going to give you a few minutes to think about it. Okay. okay. Now, I don't want you to tell me anything that's not true. Okay. If you're telling me the truth, you stick to your story. For sure. But I don't believe your story. So okay. I want, we're going to give you a few minutes to think about how you want to proceed here. 
and we're going to come back in, and you're going to tell us the real story of what happened out there. Okay. Now, if it's the story you've already told me, fine. That's going to be your version of the truth. Okay. Unfortunately, the evidence is going to, t going to point that that's not the truth. Oh, man. But, if it, but I don't want what you to happened? lie to me. Okay, I, right. I promise okay. that. Give me some minute, okay? okay. Yeah. We'll just leave that right there. Okay. Hey, Dalton. Hey. Hey, um, we're actually going to be moving you over to Ogden City Police Department. Okay. I'm going to drive you over there. Okay. Okay? I'm Detective Haney. I work with the Sheriff's Office. I'm okay. going to be taking you over. Since you're a already been booked into Weaver County, I'll take you over there and then I'll stay there until we've answered questions and stuff at Ogden City and then I'll bring you back. Okay, okay. cool. Good. I'll All get right. you over there, okay? Um, we're going to take your sandwich too. Awesome. But I got a handcuff yet. Okay. 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 You okay stand you. up. Yeah. You've got to take in the room with you. Put your hand behind your back. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring your sandwich. How was it? Well, I'm having a tough time eating today, so I just, I need to eat it all. Let me go to the water. Okay. Yeah. After having left Aiken to sit and think about his story, Detective Haney returns and informs him he is going to be moved to a different county to continue questioning. On July 30th, 2019, Dalton Aiken was charged with first-degree murder and possession of a firearm by a restricted person, which is a third-degree felony. A year to the sentence was added for the use of a dangerous weapon. Aiken will serve 16 years to life. While this gives some small amount of closure to the family of Brian Racine, they are still left in shock, disbelief, over the fact that he was killed merely for being homeless. <laughs>